Hello party people and welcome to the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. I'm uh, on the road in Iceland this week doing a road trip revisiting some of my favorite uh, places out here and this is the place where I love to start. It's the Retreat Hotel at the Blue Lagoon. It's a great place to recover from jet lag and just very zen-like. Get in the spa out here and just... I never thought I was a spa person but it turns out I'm totally a spa person. Um, this is also one of my favorite color schemes on the planet too. And I've always said that, uh, since I saw it, I've always said that if I was going to go get a custom car built, it would be in this color scheme. The water, the color of the water, the, the mosses and the lava rocks. It's just an interesting contrast in colors, although I have no idea how that would actually turn out. So let's take a look at some of your top voted questions here over on PollGab. Shiraz asks, what are your pros and cons for running on-premises SQL Server on bare metal as opposed to in VMs? I think that every SQL Server should start as a virtual machine and bare metal physical should only be your last resort when you can't get the performance that you need out of VMs. And I'll give you an example of one of those kinds of workloads. If you absolutely hammer the bejesus out of TempDB to the point where you're actually hitting disk limitations, it can be easier to run on local solid state, and that's something much more challenging in the virtual world than it is in the physical. That's rare, though. It's extremely rare for me these days to find a SQL Server that requires bare metal. Most of the time, it just makes more sense to do performance tuning so that we can get it to stay within the VM world, because you just get so many advantages with VMs around redundancy of hardware, easier hardware replacement, and so forth. Next up we have a ADBA says, what are your recommendations for Windows performance plans for SQL Server running on a VM? My private cloud vendor says it is not required to be set at high performance. The thing I would turn around and ask your, your vendor is, why don't you want it set at high performance? What are you worried about? What could it hurt? Now, yes, it's going to use a little bit more power, and yes, there are concerns that you have to do at the hypervisor layer and at the server layer as well. You need to set it at high performance across the board. But SQL Server is so expensive in terms of CPU licensing, why wouldn't you want the fastest possible response time for CPUs when you're spending $7,000 a core at the host level in order to virtualize it? I would use high power or high performance uh, settings. Why wouldn't you? Because performance is kind of important. Next up, Holy asks, can't you agree that all RD, RDBMS databases, hold on a second here, my, my phone lost its Wi-Fi connection, so I gotta like it go back in and here we go again. Um, Holy asks, for some reason it's not letting me show the question. There we go. Holy asks, can't you agree, okay, hold on a second, Holy. Anytime you find yourself saying, can't you agree or won't you agree, shouldn't you agree, that means you're being passive aggressive and immediately prompts people to go on the defensive and disagree with you. Don't ever do that. Stop doing that. That's a bad idea. It says, can't you agree that all RDB RDBMS databases are approaching their limits, just as ISAM databases did in the 1980s and 1990s? So from where I'm coming from, there are two problems with relational databases. One is performance, the other is uptime. In terms of performance, I don't see relational databases as the bottleneck. I usually see the code and the table design as the bottleneck. I guess I, I'm kind of like Apple several years ago saying, you're holding it wrong around the phone kind of thing. Most of the times when I see people hitting performance problems, I'm going to say all but two times in the last year, uh, when I've seen people hit performance problems with relational databases, I've been like, okay, let's just change this, this, and this. Okay, now you're past those limits. See, it wasn't a database problem. It was the way that we were using it. Now you're on past those limits. I have had a couple of issues. Now, of course, this people hire me for emergency performance tuning. I have had a couple of issues where we were hitting relational database limits. 
Like when someone wanted to query for the same thing 20,000 times a second. I'm like, you should be caching that in the application tier. You could argue that that's a relational database limit because SQL Server doesn't have result set caching the way that Oracle does. But I said that there's two problems here. One is performance, the other is reliability or uptime. And yeah, holy, I will totally agree with you. Relational databases have been struggling trying to achieve good uptime for decades. This isn't a new problem. It's been this way for a really long time, which is one of the reasons that NoSQL databases caught on. It was easier for them to deal with high availability when they discard things like transactions. Did I say that out loud? I suppose that I did. Sandim says, hi Brent, is it always safe to change the database setting from read committed to RCSI? No. And I wish I could give you a condensed answer on when it's not safe to do, to do so. For that, go hit my Mastering Server Tuning class. There is a module on there on isolation levels where I tell you what to look for at the server level, what changes to make at the server level if you're hitting certain problems, and how you should watch out for changes to TempDB and the user databases. I know it's hard to believe that people actually pay for my training classes. I know that you think that I probably get to places like this just because I'm some kind of social media influencer on TikTok and they give me free hotel rooms, but that's not what it is. It turns out that your coworkers and colleagues are actually paying me for my knowledge and so that they can get that knowledge. Oh, the sun's coming out. It's kind of nice. It was super bright earlier. I was actually out in the hot tubs or out in the hot springs here. They're not technically hot springs. If you want to learn more about how these waters work and why people want to come here to hang out, you can search for the Blue Lagoon. There's all kinds of stuff out there. And then we'll do one more. Mike Conrad says, Hi Brent, my team uses system version tables a lot. Our ORM, Entity Framework Core, will sometimes write updates that don't change any data, but this does generate a new history role, or history table row. Are triggers a viable way to present or prevent this? So in, in theory, what I should tell you is, is that you shouldn't do updates if you're not going to actually update anything. But I hear you, that's a pain in the rear to do change detection on the application side. What you're asking is, is could you have a trigger that says, if no rows are changed, discard the update? And you absolutely could do that. You just have to write a trigger that checks every row in the incoming update and every column in it. If you search for my name, Brent Ozar, and your trigger is probably wrong, like if your trigger uses update, it's probably wrong. I've written a blog post that demonstrates how if you, if you're not, if you don't write uh, that trigger carefully, you can actually uh, get random data out of it. So if you're going to do the trigger thing, go ahead and read that post. Brent Ozar, your trigger is probably broken. But if you're willing to put the work in, if you're willing to write those big complex triggers, I don't have a problem with it. You, just, you also have to make sure that every time you add a column to the underlying table that you also edit the trigger, because otherwise you could just add columns, and as that column is being updated, your trigger won't catch that that column is changing. The other thing you have to be aware of is that your trigger has to be the last trigger to run because what if you have other triggers that are updating something like a last updated column or uh, something that's based on the current date time then you might think that nothing was being updated if your trigger ran first and that could be a problem all right so there's a few uh, questions there for you i am going to go actually Go get back into the water because it's nice out here. I had a nap and I think I've kind of sort of recovered from jet lag. You never really know with jet lag though, do you? It just strikes at the oddest random times. Um, today is the first day out on my Iceland road trip. You know, just recovering from jet lag first. Tomorrow morning I go pick up my camper from Happy Campers and I'm driving around the south coast of Iceland in a little camper van and I'll give you all a video tour of that too as well uh, in the next office hours. Uh, stream. So I will see y'all later. Adios.